Well, here we go. Another caution for you. Reasons never to visit a zoo or a snake park. These are true tales of my African adventures. May this inspire you, deter you, caution you, and above all, entertain you. Never forget that a zoo, snake park, and animal farms are normally founded and staffed by people who are absolutely passionate about these creatures. Most develop a profound knowledge through formal and informal studies, and the creatures are usually well loved and taken care of. Animals, of course, were designed to live unrestricted in the wild and not in an enclosure. Alas, because of loss of habitat, some species today only exist in enclosures, in zoos and animal parks. In time to come, there will be many more like these. They will have become extinct in their natural state and exist only in captivity. It is therefore a blessing that there are so many dedicated people whose lives are devoted to conservation. Now, because animals are used to being in a natural state and unrestricted, when they get placed in an enclosure, the enclosure has to be animal or snake proof and the door should be kept shut. More especially since most zoos and snake parks are in cities and suburbs. I do not know of a single institution of this type where animals, some extremely dangerous, have not escaped, sometimes with dreadful results. After a number of incidents at our zoo and snake and crocodile park, I remember mentioning to my wife one day that she should never take the children to a zoo or snake park. She knew exactly what I meant. At our zoo, amongst the many creatures, we had five beautiful large black mambas, all between 2.8 and 3.5 meters. Big snakes. These are average large mambas for that time, 30 odd years ago. Almost all of them were captured on the banks of the Limpopo River, one of our favorite localities for capturing mambas. The mambas here were often an attractive olive brown in color, long, heavy bodied, and with a more gentle disposition than one would normally expect from a black mamba. Mambas are never pitch black, but are so named for the inky black color inside the mouth, which they readily show you when nervous, by gaping and making threatening gestures with their head and neck, which is usually raised off the ground. To see this display behind a sheet of glass is very interesting, but it's not so interesting if the snake is right in front of you. The enclosure our five mambas lived in was large, approximately six meters long, three meters wide, and just over two meters high. We had built a beautiful cliff face to the rear of the enclosure with an attractive and natural looking cave, more or less in the center. The cave was well lit and had overhead and underfloor heating to make sure our mambas were comfortable. The mambas had become quite tame and in time I was able to walk into the enclosure and hold food out in my unprotected hand whereupon one or more mambas would come over steadily and gently and then lift the head up to 1.5 meters above the ground slowly retrieving the food before retreating a little and consuming it. I only did this feeding trick in private when there were no visitors. This type of trust which can develop between man and beast is quite something to behold, especially when the beast is a wild captive mamba, nervous and uncompromisingly deadly. During the week we had large numbers of school children visit the zoo. On this particular day a group of nursery school children were visiting, a group of around 15 or 20. They were four or five year olds. At that age, they really loved the zoo and all the creatures and we loved watching them 
as they watched everything else. Just past the Black Mambe enclosure was a demonstration area. I would climb into the demonstration pit and spend 20 minutes or so and spend 20 minutes or half an hour talking to the children and allowing them to touch a harmless snake while they all shrieked away. It was quite delightful. They were approaching the Black Mamba enclosure when I decided to stroll up behind them and get ready to give the demonstration as they moved on to the demonstration area. The teacher was reading off the signage on the cage to the children and telling them in a hushed voice that this was the most deadly and the longest venomous snake in Africa and they were quietly ooing and eyeing at the information that was being fed to them. The mambas were lying mostly in the cave with bodies looped out and over branches and rocks which made up the landscape around the cave. How magnificent they looked, I thought. Ever alert, their heads were raised, supported by slender, elegant necks, peering at the children outside. Four heads, not five. Where is number five? Where is number five, I repeated in my mind. Its head may be tucked in under the other snakes. My eyes began to shift around in my skull as they searched every corner of the cage and the cave. Over and over. The fifth mamba wasn't there. It was missing. Gone. I stood frozen. And then I began to look on the ground and in the shrubs around the enclosure. They had been there, all five of them, less than an hour ago. I had seen them all, so the snake could not be far. The roof of the cage was corrugated iron sheeting and clear sheeting with Victorian profile, and these sheets protruded some 15 to 20 centimeters over the front of the top of the cage. There was a broad piece of timber which was secured to the top of the masonry work onto which the roof timbers were fixed. My eyes were drawn to a movement in this area and there it was, my God, a large three meter heavy bodied black mamba resting on this timber, body stretched out, head and neck protruding three quarters of a meter out into the air above the children. None of them had spotted it. Its tongue was waving as is characteristic of mambas tasting the air. And every time there was an eruption of movement from the children below, the mamba would jerk his head back ever so slightly and gape, his warning signal that he was agitated. My body erupted in goose flesh, shuddering as I took this all in. This snake could easily topple off the timber as there was nowhere for it to hold onto properly. If one of the teachers walked directly under it, there was almost no doubt that the snake would bite. If it panicked when they all moved off, it could fall off its timber support, landing amongst the children who would no doubt panic. In a situation like this, the mamba would bite a number of children and there would be more than likely several fatalities. On many occasions in the bushveld, thirsty cattle have surrounded a mamba at a waterhole, and we know of instances where several were killed by a single mamba. I was recently called to a farm to remove a mamba which had killed two magnificent stallions, a goat, a sheep, and a pig, all at the same waterhole. My throat was so dry I could hardly speak and my eyes were filled with liquid, causing me to blink repeatedly. I knew I had to act immediately. In my quietest and gentlest voice, I asked the two teachers standing furthest from the mamba's head if they could approach me and talk to me about something I wanted to show the children. In this way, I lured them away from the possibility of walking under the mamba's head. I then asked them if they could get the children to move to the left quietly so as not to frighten the snakes in the cage. They did this and the children followed the teachers away from the mamba and the mamba's cage. I then led them around a separate path to the demonstration area 
and asked them to wait there until I came shortly to give them their demonstration. From the demonstration pit you could not clearly see the black mamba's cage. I sprinted to the rear of the zoo and retrieved a hooked snake stick and ran back down to the mamba enclosure. I reached up and slowly took hold of the mamba's tail and then slipped the hook stick under it at mid-body and coaxed it gently off the timber. The mamba had become quite agitated and was not responding very well. It was too long to be handled with a hooked stick but I had no choice. I walked backwards as the mamba began to raise its head and gape and show signs of wanting to advance on me. Just two or three seconds and I was at the door. I now had to unlock the door, which meant putting the mamba down. This was becoming really messy. Suddenly I noticed the door was not closed. One of the attendants had been in the mamba cage, no doubt to change the water and in a fit of unconscious negligence, had walked off, leaving the door ajar. I was able to slip the snake into the door, pinch its tail, whereafter it slid rapidly forward up the cliff face and went and lay snugly in the cave with his mates. This event had quite a profound effect on me. The thought of all those children being in such danger was not something one could easily come to terms with. We resolved to do a thorough check of the zoo before allowing any member of the public to enter in future. During the day there would be rounds where safety would be the main objective. There are however, I am afraid, events over which one can have no control. The following is one of those. <laughs>